<laughs> um, well, good afternoon. Yeah, I want to spend the next 20 minutes looking very briefly at two <coughs> sites and how those sites are contributing to placemaking and look at the positives that archaeology can bring to the commercial developments. The two sites, which were once home to two of London's earliest playhouses, the Theatre and the Curtain, are in the London Borough of Hackney. And Hackney is probably not the place most people associate with Shakespeare and 16th century drama and performance. But this perception can radically change thanks to archaeology and commercial developers who are not seeing archaeology as a burden, but are really embracing it and its potential. The sites, uh, the stage and the theatre courtyard gallery are commercial developments that are currently under construction in Shoreditch, which is at the southern end of the borough of Hackney. Although different in terms of scale, uh, they have very, very many things in common. They are near neighbours, they're only 200 metres apart, and they're both being constructed around and over the remains of two of London's earliest Elizabethan playhouses, the Theatre and the Curtain. The stage is the name of the redevelopment that includes the curtain, and the theatre site will be known as the Theatre Courtyard Gallery. Archaeological excavations has found that, yeah, that the curtain was a rectangular structure measuring around 22 metres by 25 metres with a narrow stage flanked by um, side stage rooms and shares many similarities with this uh, playhouse in Spain, in Almogra. While the theatre, also around 22 metres across, shares many similarities with the rose built slightly later, 1587, on Bankside. And that's kind of what we've got depicted here in this panorama uh, of London from the early 17th century. Two very different looking buildings, but quite close. Although different in design, both the theatre and the curtain were up and running in 1577, and both were home to acting companies that included, uh, who have we got? We've got um, Richard Tolton, who's kind of clown and comedian. We've got Burbage in the middle there. Richard Burbage played the title roles in Othello and Richard III. And we've got Will Kemp, who played the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. And of course, Shakespeare, the author of Romeo and Juliet and a few other things. Traditionally, most people have associated Shakespeare with Stratford-upon-Avon. Geographically, he's connected to this place up north. But it's the place where he was born and it's the place where he was died, where he died. But and more recently, I guess, thanks to the reconstructed or the modern globe on Bankside, he's kind of got, you know, we've kind of got that connection in our heads that he kind of was hanging around in London at some point. In 1678. Uh, John Aubrey wrote a biography of the playwright Ben Jonson. And he said that Jonson acted and wrote at the Green Curtain, but both ill. A kind of nursery or obscure playhouse, somewhere in the suburbs, I think towards Shoreditch or Clerkenwell. So the curtain closed in the 1620s, so writing 50 years later, Aubrey's is the first record of the curtain being a place of the past, a forgotten space. And as a place of the past, it kind of carried on intriguing um, scholars for another kind of three centuries. So research into the location of Elizabethan and Jacobean playing spaces, with which people have this kind of strong connection <coughs> to, really began in earnest in the 19th century. And historians found that along with the inns and the indoor playing spaces, there were a handful of these playhouses built up out in the suburbs. So you've got that a few to the north of London, and a few down there on Bankside. In the early 20th century, the historian W.W. W. Brains was scouring archives and for documents such as leases and court records that related to the Burbage family and the theatre. 
And using these documents, he managed to calculate the position of the theatre, which he thought was there, and we found it there. So he fairly accurately located it, although he did conclude by saying the task of defining it with more accuracy must be left to some future investigator who may have obtained, obtained more precise evidence, though personally I'm inclined to doubt whether such evidence exists. <laughs> so obviously he hadn't reckoned on archaeological science being a thing. So, so the evidence that Shakespeare and his contemporaries had connections to Shoreditch were already there. But you had to know where to look. So these signs were um, put up in the 1970s by the Borough of Hackney. And this memorial to the actors buried in St. Leonard's, the parish church, was installed by the Shakespeare League in 1913. But it's the top of, you know, you have to go all the way into the church, up the <coughs> stairs, and it's sort of on a wall at the top of the stairs. So Shoreditch is connection to early drama had been recognised for a long time. It just not been widely celebrated. But now, thanks to archaeology, it's about to change. Both the stage and the theatre courtyard gallery are projects that were taken on by our current clients after the initial evaluations had shown there was potential potentially significant playhouse remains on the site. Our clients actively chose to redevelop these sites because of, not despite of, the archaeology. They didn't see archaeology as a risk, but they saw it as an asset. They saw its power and its potential. And we all know the power of archaeology in forming um, a physical connection to the past, but often people find it difficult to articulate why that physical connection is important, why being in that same space is important. But I think 160 years ago, John Ruskin had a very good turn of phrase when describing what that feeling of old buildings can instill. In 1849, in an essay on the subject of restoration, John Ruskin wrote, the greatest glory of a building is not in its stone nor in its gold, its glory is in its age and in that deep sense of voicefulness, of stern watching, of mysterious sympathy, nay, even of approval or condemnation, which we feel in the walls that have long been washed by the passing waves of humanity. And that choice of words, which we feel, I think are key. That emotional connection to the world around us is a powerful tool. Unique and authentic walls that speak to us on an emotional level. The Theatre Courtyard Gallery on the site of the theatre is the smaller of the two projects uh, and the one that's nearer to completion. It should be open in April next year. And the architects of the project are Gallus Studios. The architects and exhibition designers have had a really small space to work with, but have a plan to reference the archaeology within the fabric of the building, as well as creating a traditional kind of exhibition space along the back wall with a viewing panel in the floor, and using AR to create that sense of being within the theatre on a summer's afternoon in the 1590s. So the building is due for completion next year, but this summer uh, the site was catalyst for Shake It Up, um, a weekend festival celebrating William Shakespeare designed for people to discover Shoreditch in a whole new light. And it included uh, dramatic Discoveries, Recreating the Theatre, which was an exhibition that highlighted artworks made by eight and nine-year-olds from the nearby Columbia School. Mola took finds from the site into the school and introduced the excavation, and the project and Art Hoppers and Rich Mix then worked with the kids to create uh, replica ceramic tiles and money boxes. And their work was displayed as part of that exhibition. So already, even before the new building is open, archaeology on the site is already contributing to and enriching the life of its community. Meanwhile, 200 metres up the road is the site of the stage. 
At the stage, we have been dealing with the archaeology on a large urban redevelopment in response to planning conditions placed on that redevelopment by the local planning authority. And the archaeology is funded by uh, Kane International, who head up the consortium redeveloping the site. So far, a fairly standard narrative of commercial archaeology. But, like the theatre, just up the road, the archaeology and the history of the site has very much been physically and conceptually at the heart of the project, even before any application was made to redevelop the site. So the consortium who now have this site have really embraced the archaeology, which unfortunately I feel is quite, you know, quite away from the standard current you know, narrative of commercial archaeology. It's infuriating. So the stage, so-called, because the best preserved element of the playhouse is the masonry foundations for the stage. And the architects for the project are Perkins and Will, and the total cost of their project, their building commercial and residential uh, spaces, is around 750 million. And they are putting 25 million pounds into preserving the archaeology and creating a visitor center. The enthusiasm of international institutions to back this major development highlights not only the quality of its design and its success to date, but also its global significance as, one of, as the site of one of Shakespeare's earliest theatres. Not my words, but the words of Jonathan Goldstein, Chief Executive for Kane International. And he's genuinely enthusiastic about the archaeology on their site, and that's even when there isn't a reporter in the room looking for a soundbite. <laughs> Jonathan is on the left, uh, standing next to Ed Vasey, who at the time was an MP and headed up uh, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, Lily Ling, the UK Managing Director of VANC, China's largest property company, also talked about this project in terms of its uniqueness and cultural and historic importance. So it really is the archaeology that's the draw for UK and overseas investors into backing this project. And we often hear the phrase kind of placemaking. And sometimes it's difficult to pin down exactly what people mean by that. But John Drew, uh, who's the design principal for Perkins and Will, described it thus. The stage will transform an impermeable and once neglected part of Shoreditch into a major international visitor attraction with a new sustainable mixed use neighborhood. It will make a valuable contribution to its cultural, social and economic development of the surrounding area and reinforce London as a world city. And if that doesn't sum up what placemaking is all about, I'm not sure what does. But for this to work, for this museum space to work, it has to be authentic, it has to be explainable, it has to be accessible and it has to be future-proof. Not a pastiche of the past. Now, I love the modern globe, don't get me wrong, but I love it for what it is. It's a 20th century playhouse built in Elizabethan style. It's not the real thing. It's not even on the site of the original globe. So standing on that stage is not standing in the same space as Shakespeare's, Shakespeare and his contemporaries. It's not being able to move through the same space that saw the first production, say, Henry V. To create a space that allows people to do that is indeed the stage's unique selling point, its USP. Around the corner from the modern globe is the Rose Playhouse. The site was the first playhouse to be, um, to be excavated way back in ooh, 1989, and the excavation found around two thirds of the building's footprint. The Rose has, we've kind of already touched on it, a remarkable legacy in 1989, the public outcry at the imminent destruction <coughs> of the playhouse at the hands of developers led to the creation of the Save the Rose campaign. There were 24-hour vigils outside the site. And high-profile figures ensured that it had a voice. And the imminent threat to the archaeology that so many people kind of felt this connection to led to headlines around the world and questions asked of government as to how this had been allowed to happen. And obviously the impetus for that legitimization of archaeology 
um, in the development process resulted in the introduction of PPG 16 in 1990. The playhouse was preserved and redesigned and the new building kind of spans the archaeological remains. And today, red rope lights um, around the site indicate the position of the playhouse's footprint. There's a viewing platform uh, from which these lights can be seen and an exhibition explaining the history of the Rose and Bank site. Now, I recently asked a fellow archaeologist who had been to the Rose to see a play what they thought, and I had it described this way. Yes, it was an intimate performance space, and they really enjoyed knowing they were in direct dialogue with an Elizabethan playhouse, a unique theatre. But as far as understanding the archaeology, there was very little to interpret where they were and what was below their feet. And also, it's kind of a pivotal role in the creation of commercial archaeology as we know it. I was invited to... Just going to grab a slosh of water. Hmm. I was invited to um, join an interesting... Uh, panel discussion as part of this year's London Festival of Architecture, where we looked at and discussed how best to use immersive technologies, how it can be best used to interpret archaeology authentically, bring history to life, educate, inspire across generations, all those great headlines, headline themes, and debate focused on how to recreate that feeling of being within a playhouse while retaining the authenticity of space. But can immersive technology ever replace the sensory experience of the original? I don't think it can. Nothing can replace that sense of being in the space. It can't replace the excitement of seeing and feeling the real thing, and it can't replace the power that archaeology has in people's imagination. But it can help to interpret space. It can be that go-between. It can be that interpreter between visitor and the archaeology. It can evoke atmosphere and add layers of texture to the experience of being in that unique space. Shakespeare was only 12 when the curtain and the theatre were built, but I think I probably mentioned his name around a dozen times in as many minutes. It's the name that will get folks through the doors of both the exhibition spaces at the stage and at the Theatre Courtyard Gallery. But once inside, much wider themes can be explored, such as the role of women in running theatrical enterprises, the range of entertainments, uh, which were then described as play, the diversity of Shoreditch's community, and how and why commercial playhouses came to be built in Elizabethan England. And Maybe other playwrights will get a quick mention too. Strat, these are stories that really haven't until now had a platform. So these will both be powerful spaces with powerful stories to tell. So where do we go from here? Well, I'm not suggesting every site should be preserved in situ, within or below you know, purpose-built museum spaces. But I know more could be made of many of our um, archaeology and built heritage assets than is at present, and in more creative ways. The more of these projects there are, the more they're embedded in the consciousness of developers and planners. And planners can think more creatively about the conditions placed on developments, and I think we'll get more creative developments as a result. For instance, another of our... Um, my projects is the site of the Boar's Head Playhouse in Tower Hamlets. And there we go. <laughs> Good old Boar's Head. Um, it was granted planning consent in June this year and has the following conditions. A and B, uh, sorry, A and C are fairly standard, but B is interesting. It's an interesting addition. It's a programme of public engagement, uh, sorry, public education, outreach and interpretation, both during and immediately after the archaeological investigation. So I have this feeling that there is change and it is happening. 
So working with the design team and consortium partners on both sites of the Theatre and the Curtain has really shown me, and I hope it shows others, how archaeology can sit within a project. It's not a hindrance or a burden, not an extra needless cost, nor a mindless one, as we heard earlier. I thought that was fantastic. Not an afterthought, not something to be remediated as quickly as possibly and cheaply as possibly, but something to be at the heart of the development, something to be valued for what it is and what it can bring, valued for its uniqueness and its, and its authenticity, valued for its USP. Just hope John Ruskin would approve. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.